Uh, let's do a Bible study. And of course, on Wednesday, we go verse by verse, chapter by chapter. We're going through the whole of the Bible. And when we finish in uh, Genesis, we will start over again. This is our fourth time through the whole Bible, going verse by verse. And we are tonight going to be in Second Chronicles. In uh, Second Chronicles chapter 21, if you need a Bible, there are some extras there at the usher stations uh, in the back of the sanctuary. If you don't have a Bible, uh, you're more than welcome to keep it as our gift to you. All right, let's pray and then uh, just receive from God's word. Father, we do thank you <clears throat> because we know your word is power. Your word is your heart revealed to us. And so, God, we open our heart to receive and just pray that you would use it uh, strongly in our lives because we know that it is the power to transform us. And that is the very desire we have. So we ask that in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. We're looking now at the southern kingdom uh, of Judah. Northern kingdom is Israel. Ten tribes in the north, two in the south. And, uh, and the kings in the south have, for the most part, been, let's say, good. Uh, especially when you compare them to the kings of Israel in the north. Because they went from bad to badder to worse to worser to worsest to Ahab. And uh, that's, that's the condition of things in the north. We were just looking at Jehoshaphat uh, in the south. And uh, he was a good, uh, he made his mistakes. We look at some of his mistakes. But he was a good uh, man. There was good in him. He had a good heart. And he followed the Lord uh, well. And so, but we pick it up now in chapter 21. Where it tells us uh, that this story is about to turn. And it's going to turn dark. And it's going to turn dark for a reason. Notice what it says. Then Jehoshaphat slept with his fathers and was buried with his fathers in the city of David. And Jehoram, his son, became king in his place. Okay. He had brothers, the sons of Jehoshaphat. They were Azariah, Yahiel, Zechariah, Azrayahu, Mikael, Jephthah, uh, uh, Chef Atiyah, all these were the sons of Jehoshaphat, king of Israel. And their father gave them many gifts. He loved his sons. They were very precious to him. So he gifted them with many things. He gave them silver, gold, precious things. He also gave them fortified cities. In, in other words, he gave them authority to uh, help in the rule of the kingdom. And so they had fortified cities there in Judah. But he gave the kingdom to Jehoram because he was the firstborn. Now that's all important backstory to where this thing is going to turn. Because it tells us that when Jehoram had taken over the kingdom of his father and made himself secure that he killed all of his brothers. Now, this is just despicable. This is just a turn of evil that is unexpected. This ought not to be. What is this? He killed his brothers with the sword and even some of the rulers of Israel also. And Jehoram was 32 years old when he became king and he reigned eight years in Jerusalem. And he walked in the way of the kings of Israel, just as the house of Ahab did, who was the worstest of the worst up there in the north. And he it goes on to explain why this is so, that he walked in the way of the kings of Israel, as the house of Ahab did, because Ahab's daughter was his wife. Or to put it differently, Jezebel was his was his mother-in-law. Now she was the epitome of evil. And her influence is now going to be revealed. Now, how did this come about? How could this possibly be? Well, the answer comes from Jehoshaphat. One of the mistakes that he made was that he tried to build, well, he did build this alliance with Israel in the north by arranging this marriage. Uh, that Ahab and Jezebel's daughter would be married to his son. 
And I, as I mentioned last week, I, I think his intent was good. It just was ill-advised. He didn't ask God. God would have, would have told him, I don't want you building alliances with the uh, kingdom of the north. I'm about to bring trouble upon them. I'm about to bring correction to them. I'm about to bring a load of storms that they will not endure. And you're going to build an alliance? God would have stopped him. But he didn't ask God. And so he made this alliance. He arranged for their daughter, Athaliah, to be married to uh, his son. Now, the, as I mentioned, the seeds of trouble have been planted, and the seeds will bear out the fruit of that corruption. Because this is a biblical principle that I mentioned last week, and it's an important principle. Uh, we call it the principle of the harvest. And this is seen not only in the Old Testament, it is seen also in the New Testament. Galatians chapter 6 is one of those chapters you might want to memorize because it speaks very powerfully, powerfully to this principle, the principle of the harvest. And that goes this way, Galatians chapter 6. Do not be deceived. Now that, that's a great way to start a very serious verse. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For that which a man sows, that he will also reap. That he will also reap. If a man sows to the flesh, then he will of that flesh reap. Corruption is what he will reap. If you sow to the wind, you will reap a whirlwind. That's, that's what he's saying. But then he gives this wonderful promise, but hey, if you sow to the Spirit, you will reap life, even eternal life, for the Spirit of the living God is the life of God. And when you sow to the Spirit, which means that you are moving in spiritual things, you desire spiritual things, you want the result of spiritual things in your life, God's going to bless you with spiritual blessings. And I can absolutely assure you that the blessings that come from the Spirit are way better than anything that the flesh has to offer. Anything that the flesh has to offer. I'm saying anything. No matter what this world has to offer, it is nothing in comparison to that which God has for you in the Spirit. Does anybody believe what I'm saying? It's absolutely a truth to take hold of. Because it will change the course of your life. Wise is the one who knows this when he is young. Oh, how I wish I would have known when I was 20, what I know today, it would have changed all oh, the blessings that I could have secured, all oh, the joy I could have walked in, all oh, the trouble I could have avoided. Anybody know what I'm saying here? Oh, the trouble I could have avoided. See, anyone who's younger than 30, please hear this. Because we love you and we don't want bad things in your life. See, it's like, it's like a parent. Right, Every parent wants their children to do well. Every parent wants their children to do well. The problem is children are blind. They cannot see beyond the immediacy of what's around them. They cannot understand the idea of reaping far into the future. Everything is about right now. The moment, the, the immediacy, you know, of the reward of the thing, the pleasurable thing that the world has. They don't understand the idea uh, that you sow today and you, you plant and you nurture and you feed and you wait. They don't understand that. It's very hard to understand. But we who've lived enough years know very, very well that when you wait on the Lord to bless your life, the Lord will surely do it. And I have seen the blessings, oh, I have seen the blessings of God been poured out on my life so abundantly that I have come to understand it very vividly. I don't want what the world has. I want what God has for me. Anybody else agree with me? Let's give the Lord praise. Absolutely. 
And this thing is going to come out now in living color. How bad can it get? You're probably wondering, how bad can this story get? I'm glad you asked. Well, it's going to be bad. Let's follow the story. But notice verse 7. The Lord was not willing to destroy the house of David because of the covenant with which he had made with David and since he had promised to give a lamp to him and his sons forever. If you remember, David was a man after God's own heart and David wanted to bless the Lord by building God a house. But God said, no, you're a man of war. But I love the fact that you wanted to do it. David, that blesses me so much. I'm going to give you a house. You want to give me a house? I'm going to give you a house. And it will be a spiritual house. There will be a son of David to sit on the throne of Israel forever. That is a, that is a, man, that's a covenant. That's a, man, that's a promise. And so he says, God is faithful to his word. And he has promised to give a lamp to David and his sons forever. Now, sometimes that lamp is a barely burning wick. But God holds on to his word. Now, it tells us, oh, it, now it starts out with light trouble. There's trouble. Notice verse 8. In his days, Edom. Uh, this is a kingdom in the south. In his days, now up to this point, by the way, uh, or uh, up to the recent decades, uh, Edom has been subject to uh, Israel's rule, Judah's rule over Edom. Uh, they were <clears throat> subjugated and paid tributes and whatever. But now they revolted against the rule of Judah and they set up a king over themselves. So Jehoram crossed over with his commanders and all his chariots with him. And it came about that he uh, arose by night and struck down the Edomites who were surrounding him and the commanders of the chariots. Now, it, it doesn't really give us a lot of insight. We know from uh, uh, Second Kings that what had happened was he was surrounded and he barely escaped, but he counterattacked and did escape, though two results came of it. One, it tells us, verse 10, so Edom revolted against Judah to this day. So they continued in their uh, place of revolt, throwing off Judah. We don't want you anymore. And then it tells us in 2 Kings that his men went back to their tents. His men abandoned him, went back home. And so he was weakened out of this because there's another spiritual principle at play. And that spiritual principle is when you follow after the Lord, you follow after the ways of the Lord, you seek the things of God, you are strengthened. Strength of faith brings strength of life in the immediacy of your life. You will, you will see strength of faith brings strength of life. And if you follow away from the Lord, go the way of the wilderness and turn your heart after other things and turn your heart into the world, then you are weakened as a man. You are weakened as a person. You're weakened in life. This is the principle. It's been, it's been seen, whether it be a person or a people or a nation, and it's being seen right now. Moreover, verse 11, he made high places in the mountains of Judah, and he caused the inhabitants of Jerusalem to play the harlot. That's an interesting phrase there. Let's remember it. We'll come back. To play the harlot with these uh, high places. In other words, their altars uh, to Baal and Ashtoreth or whatever. And he led Judah astray. Then a letter came to him. A letter. Who from? Elijah. The prophet, who is a prophet in the north, the most powerful prophet in the Old Testament, he got a letter from Elijah. And this is what Elijah says, verse 12. Thus says Jehovah. Whenever you see Lord in all caps, it is the name of God. Yahweh. Thus says the Lord, God of your father David. 
Because you have not walked in the ways of Jehoshaphat, your father, or the ways of Asa, his grandfather, king of Judah. No, you have walked in the way of the kings of Israel. And you have caused Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to play the harlot as the house of Ahab has played the harlot. And then you went and you killed your brothers, your own family who were better than you. You, know, you love Elijah. He doesn't hold anything back. Elijah is a man full of confidence because he's full of the Holy Spirit and he knows he's standing in the right place. What a, what a powerful word. Now he's going to tell him the consequence in a moment. But he's pointing out to him the, the, the faults of his life. The way you walked, you didn't walk after the way of your father. Your father was a good example. You didn't follow that. You walked in the way of Ahab, your father-in-law. Doesn't matter how you walk. Doesn't matter how you live. Surely it does. This is important because some people don't understand this. They think, well, you know, as long as I believe, doesn't matter what I do. I counter that by saying, well, if you really believed, it would change what you do. And therefore, it matters how we live, what we do, how we walk, how we live. It matters because it is the result of our faith or lack thereof. But notice, he says, you did not walk in that way. And then he says, you have caused Judah and the inhabitants of Israel to play the harlot. Just as the house of Ahab played the harlot. Now, what does he mean by this? It's a, it's a powerful word. Uh, by the way, the phrase played the harlot in Hebrew is just one word. Harlotted. Um, let's see, that's why there's not a good English word for it. You harlotted, you went a whoring, that sort of thing. Then you might say, well, this is a strong thing to say. Uh, to say to someone, you went a whoring. What does it mean, spiritually speaking? Well, God is using a very, very interesting and powerful analogy. And that is that of, of the relationship that we have. That God wants to have with us is the, the nearest of intimacy. You know, when a husband and a wife um, are, are, are married beautifully and uh, they are what we would then call soulmates, you, right? I, I, did a, I did a memorial service just yesterday and uh, the relationship that they had is of course a tragedy when someone loses a soul mate and uh, but it's beautiful at the same time soul mate it's a picture of a relationship that's very close isn't it well God uses that same kind of analogy to speak to the kind of relationship that he wants to have with his people that, that the soul, the passion of your relationship to him would be beautiful. There's something beautiful in the relationship that God wants with us. To make a beautiful soul. To make a beautiful life that comes out of a beautiful relationship to God. And he uses the relationship of marriage to picture it. But when Israel went after these other gods. He said, you went a whoring. See, you were, he uses, I, I want to be careful. I don't know. I can't see all the children if we have children here. I want to be careful about how I say this. I want to be tasteful. But there is a powerful analogy he's using. Does everybody get it? We all understand it. I don't have to get into detail. He's talking about, of course, how offensive it is to God when a people go after the things of the world when they have been in a relationship to the Lord and have tasted of the beauty and have experienced how much God loves them. And then they don't understand it. They don't appreciate it. Uh, you know, they go, 
he says, go all whoring. And uh, it's a powerful thing. In fact, I was debating in my mind whether I wanted to do this, but all right, I'm, I won the debate with myself. I would, if you wouldn't mind, would you open your Bibles, uh, turn in your Bibles to Ezekiel chapter 16. Chapter 16 of Ezekiel, I only want to read a part of it, but it kind of pictures this very thing. Uh, I'm not going to read the whole of the chapter because it not, okay, you know what is, is interesting? There are some chapters in the Bible that ought not be read in front of children. Do you understand what I'm saying? And this is one of those chapters, it ought not be read in front of children. So with wisdom, I will read part of it. But it's a powerful point. He's making a powerful point about how much it matters to God. That's the point. About how much it matters to God. How much you matter to him. How precious you are. How much he values the love between you and God. How much of a treasure is this? It matters to God. And so he uses this chapter to, to point it out. And again, I will not read all of it because of the nature of it. But notice, first few verses, chapter 16. This is the word of the Lord that came to me, Ezekiel says. And it's this. Son of man, make known to Jerusalem her abominations and say this. Thus says Jehovah, God, uh, the Lord God to Jerusalem. Your origin and your birth are from the land of the Canaanite. Your father was an Amorite. Your mother was a Hittite. And that's kind of a harsh way of saying you had no background. As for your birth, on the day you were born, your navel cord was not even cut, nor were you washed with water for cleansing. You were not even rubbed with salt or even wrapped with cloths. No, I looked with pity on you to do any of these things, to have compassion on you. Rather, you were thrown out into the open field when you were born. For you were abhorred on the day you were born. But I passed by. When I passed by, I saw you there squirming in your blood. And I said to you there while you were in your blood, I said, live. I said to you there while you were in your blood, I said to you, live. He repeats it twice. I made you numerous. See how I blessed you? I made you numerous like plants of the field. Then you, were, you grew up. You became tall. You reached the age of fine ornaments. Your breasts were formed. Your hair had grown. Yet you were naked and bare. So I passed by and I saw you. And behold, you were at the time for love. So I spread my skirt over you and covered your nakedness. That's a marriage proposal. And I swore to you. And I entered into a covenant with you. So that you became mine. He's speaking of a marriage so that you became mine, declares Jehovah, the Lord God. I bathed you with water. I washed off your blood. I anointed you with oil. I clothed you with embroidered cloth. I put sandals of porpoise skin on your feet. This is, the, this is like the classiest of classiest of sandals. You have to get this from France. It's so expensive. I don't even know what the women's uh, shoes are that are expensive. Where, okay, forget it. <laughs> I wrapped you with fine linen. I covered you with silk. Silk. You gotta, where do you get silk in these days? Oh, how rare was this? I adorned you with ornaments. I put bracelets on your hands. I put a necklace around your neck. I put a ring in your nostril. Oh, this is good. This is good. This is like adorning a beauty in these days. I put a, a ring, earring in your ears. I put a beautiful crown on your head. Now look at the transition. I took you from that birth. And then later I took you as my wife. And then I blessed you. I poured all of these things out on you. I even put a crown, beautiful crown on your head. Thus, verse 13, you were adorned with gold and silver and your dress was the finest of linens, silk, embroidered cloth. You ate the finest of fines. Oh, you ate fine flour, honey, oil. You were exceedingly beautiful. And advanced even to royalty. 
and your fame became known. It went forth among the nations on account of your beauty. For it was perfect. Notice this here. It was perfect. Your beauty was so good. It was so perfect. You were so beautiful. Because of my splendor. Because of my splendor. I poured all of this out on you. Ah, you were, be- you're, you were so beautiful that you were the talk of the nations. Because I bestowed on, my, on you my splendor. Declares the Lord God. But verse 15. But you trusted in your beauty. And you played the harlot. Because of your fame. You took it for granted. And you poured out your harlotries. On every passerby. Now look at the contrast. I was your husband. And then you, every stranger who came by, you made love to. What is this? Every passerby who might be willing. And then you took some of your clothes and you made for yourself high places of various colors and you played the harlot on them. Which should never come about. Which should never happen. Now, That's a long chapter, and he goes through great detail in describing it ad nauseum. But would you jump forward to verse 60? Because after going through this entire chapter of describing everything I just said about how bad it got, that he says in verse 60, nevertheless, now nevertheless is one of the greatest words in the languages of the world. Nevertheless. I will remember my covenant with you that I made with you in the days of your youth. And I will establish with you an everlasting covenant with you. Nevertheless, in spite of everything that you have done, I will take you back. Now, you got to just love how beautiful this is. I will take you back. God never is so beautiful because anytime someone comes to their senses and they awaken spiritually and they realize, I've been playing the harlot. I've been playing the fool. I don't want this. This doesn't do anything in my life. This thing is not blessing me. This thing is actually destroying me. This thing is standing in the way of that which God would do in my life. I want the blessings I had with God. I don't want the world in my life anymore. I want God in my life and the greatness news is he says nevertheless verse 62 I will establish my covenant with you and then you will know that I am your God I am Jehovah and I never give up on anyone who will turn around and come home don't you love the Lord on this amen let's give the Lord praise it's beautiful so back now to second chronicles where we were and he's the letter from Elijah And then he says, verse 14, Behold, the Lord is going to strike your people, your sons, your wives, and all your possessions with a great calamity, and you will suffer severe sickness. It will be a disease of your bowels until your bowels come out because of this sickness day by day. That's his letter. Now, that's a warning. You know, whenever God sends a warning, it's an opportunity. Here's the thing. It's not too late. You know, he's made all of these terrible choices and all of these mistakes. You know what would have happened if he would have humbled himself? You know what would have happened? We just read it in Ezekiel 16. God would have taken him back. All it requires is that we come with a humble heart. God always welcomes the one who's humble. And so there's the letter. Notice then. Verse 16, then the Lord stirred up against Jehoram, the spirit of the Philistines and the Arabs who boarded the Ethiopians. They came against Judah and invaded it and carried away all the possessions that were found in the king's house together with his sons and his wives so that no son was left to him except Jehoaz, the youngest of his sons. 
This is tragedy upon tragedy upon tragedy upon tragedy. But this is part of the fruit of the seeds that he has sown. So after all of this, the Lord smote him in his bowels with an incurable sickness. And it came about in the course of time, at the end of two years, that his bowels came out because of his sickness, and he died in great pain. Now, what is this sickness? I'm not a doctor, nor do I play one on TV. But I'm going to guess. I'm going to, you can look this up later and see. I, I think he doesn't know what he's talking about. Or, hey, that makes sense. I think, personally, because uh, I've read different commentaries who are guessing, and they, oh, he probably had cancer. No, I think he had a hernia. Any doctors in the house? I think he had a hernia. And hernias, if you don't know, uh, are like a, a, a weak spot in your muscle. And, uh, and you can have your bowels come out. And it hurts. I've never had this happen to me. But I know people who have had it happen. And it's very, very painful. And it gets worse. And you push it back in. And then it pops back out again. And you push it back out. And it, it goes this way and gets bigger and bigger. And it gets to the point where you can't get it back in again. And now you will die. It is unto death. Because it is that dangerous. So there you go. Write it down. It's the Rich Jones commentary. I think that's what happened. All right. But notice this. And his people made no fire for him. Like they would make the fire for his fathers. Why? Because the people have had it with him. They don't respect him. But you notice this? He was 32 years old when he became king. And he reigned in Jerusalem for eight years. Notice this phrase. And he departed with no one's regret. Now, well, how would you like that as a commentary of your life? He departed, he died, with no one's regret. And they buried him in the city of David, but not in the tombs of the kings. Because when he died, no one regretted it. They were glad to see him be gone. You know, when you get to the end of your life, wouldn't you like it if people could have said, this man, this one, that was a beautiful life. That was a beautiful soul. Well done. And give honor because of how you lived your life. Wouldn't that be the desire? That's what I want. That's what I want. I want people to look back. And, and I'm not perfect. No one among us is. But I want, I want, I want, I want it to, to, to be seen in my life. My life meant something. I made a difference in this world. And that there would be honor because I lived my heart out to the fullest of what I could do. Anybody want to live the same way? I live my heart out in the fullest of what I could do. You know, I tell you, when I think about this, I think about my father. Many of you know my story. My father was an alcoholic. Uh, he was uh, abusive, angry, cantankerous, difficult. That was my growing up years. And, uh, but when I was a young man, I prayed for my father. I, I was very uh, emotional, you might say, as a young man. And uh, I was very angry because of my emotions. But I also prayed for him. And I wrote even a song for my dad. And that song was a prayer. I don't have a copy. I wish I did have a copy of it. But the song was called Old Man. It was respectful. And I was a prayer for him. But all of those years, that cantankerous, difficult person who did so many things that made so many people angry, the way he treated our mother made us most angry of all. And then, uh, too much to describe, he, he divorced her and, and uh, drove away to some far-off state to no one's regret. And then my brother died. My oldest brother died. Long story. And he came for, for the funeral. 
many in the family didn't want him to come. And, uh, but he wanted to come. And I said, well, if he wants to come, then he should come. And we can't, we can't keep this up. And they said, well, then you can just keep him in your house. You know, fine. So he came up and stayed with me. And during those days, we started talking. And God started stirring. And he said, I've come to see it now. I didn't see it before. But I see it now. I've wasted my life. I haven't been a good father. Is it too late? Can I be in your life? Would you help me? Of course I would help you. I moved him up. I was managing apartments. And uh, I, I moved him up and he uh, lived uh, in, in the same apartment complex there. My mom was also living in the apartment complex. And he came to church. And the next time he came to church, I gave an invitation. He raised his hand. And I remember so very clear, clearly because he was sitting in the back and in the middle. And, and when he raised his hand, he raised his hand with a, such a strong decision. Anyone who would like to receive Christ, you know, please raise your hand. And all I could say was, come here. And he came forward. I hugged him. I was crying. I said, this is my dad. I broke out in song. I said, I exalt thee. We prayed together. I gave, we did the sinner's prayer and I led him to Christ. And then we had a baptism service coming up. I got to baptize him with my own hands. Same day that I baptized our oldest daughter. What a day was this, right? We had four more years with him. Now, four more years as a changed man. Not perfect, but changed. And when he passed, I assure you that the death that he experienced when he passed was very, very different than the death that he would have had had he not changed his life. Because the death that he did have, all of us were around his bed. Even my mom. They became friends. And when he breathed his last, we were all there. But I remember the privilege of saying, I reached up and I closed his eyes. And I said, Father, into your hands, I commend his spirit. He died very differently because he changed his heart. God can change. It's never too late. That's one of the great lessons I've learned in this life. It's never too late. God can take anyone who will humble himself and turn that life around. And God will welcome and will rebuild and will restore. And that is a great, great lesson that comes out of this story. Don't you want to live in such a way? That when you breathe your last on this earth, that you hear those words, well done, my good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of your master. And then the people who remain say, well lived, my friend, well lived. Amen. Don't you want that? Let's give the Lord praise. Absolutely. But let's make a better pace. Chapter 22. Then the inhabitants of Jerusalem made Ahaziah, his youngest son, king in his place. For the band of men who came with the Arabs to the camp had slain all the older sons. So Ahaziah, the son of Joram, king of Judah, began to reign. Ahaziah was 22 years old when he became king. And he reigned one year. One year in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Athaliah who was the granddaughter of Omri, who was the daughter of Jezebel. He walked in the ways, his mother, that's his mother. The influence of a mother is now going to be seen. 
He walked in the ways of the house of Ahab, for his mother was his counselor to do wickedly. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord, like the house of Ahab, for they were his counselors after the death of his father to his destruction. And he walked according to their counsel. And he went with Jehoram, the son of Ahab, king of Israel. So he's aligned himself with the son of Ahab, Jehoram, to wage war against Hazael, king of Aram, and Ramoth Gilead. But the Arameans wounded Jehoram. That's the king. Now, don't, don't get confused. Follow this track because it's important. It's intriguing. So he goes up and lines up with the, the Jehoram, son of Ahab. They go to war together. The son of the king of the north is wounded. So it says, verse 6, he returns to be healed in Jezreel of the wounds which he had, had inflicted at him on Reva. When he had fought against Haziel, king of Aram. And Ahaziah, son of Jehoram, king of Judah, went down to see Jehoram, son of Ahab in Jezreel, because he was sick. Follow this? So Ahaziah, because that's his cousin basically, uh, goes to see him because he's sick, he's wounded. But notice verse 7 now the destruction of Ahaziah, God's going to use this as a destruction. The destruction of Ahaziah was from God in that he went to Joram. For when he came, he went out with Joram against Jehu, son of Dimshi, whom the Lord had anointed to cut off the house of Ahab. Now that's a real small, quick summary of intrigue that was going on in the north. God's going to end this Ahab business and he anointed Jehu to do it. And so, Ahaziah gets caught up in the whole thing. So Jehu it was, was there in this place, and uh, uh, the prophet Elisha sent a man with anointing oil and said, call Jehu, bring him to a private room, anoint him with oil, and then you say, thus says the Lord, you are now the king of Israel in the north, and you will settle this uh, with the house of Ahab and with Jezebel, his wife says the Lord. And so then he made that prophecy, turned around and ran home. And so Jehu comes out of this private meeting and his friend said, what did that man have to say to you? Uh, he says, oh, he didn't want to say it. Oh, you know that bad man in his talk. And that's not true. What did he say? And he told him, he said this, that I am now anointed to be the king of Israel and to settle this thing with Ahab. And they said, long live the king. He is now our king. And they took him up immediately as king. And then before a word can even go forth, he, 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 he launched a raid. Get my horses. And he went flying to Jezreel. And the watchman at Jezreel says, there's a band coming. And the king said, send, uh, send a scout and ask him if this is peace or war. So he sends a scout. When the scout arrives, uh, the man says to Jehu, is this peace? Jehu says, what do you have to do with peace? Get behind me. Fall in. So the, scout, uh, the, the watchman says, he, he came to them, but he didn't come back. Send another one. The scout came up to Jehu. Is this peace? What do you have to do with peace? Get behind me. This, the lookout says, another one fell back behind him also. And he, it looks like Jehu because he's driving furiously. The king says, launch my horse. And so he goes out. And Ahaziah just happens to be with him. So they go out. Jehu, is this peace? Jehu says, and how can there be peace when your mother Jezebel is destroying Israel? Immediately he said, treachery is treachery is treason. And he, 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 he ran for his life and Jehu took a bow and ended his life. 
But Ahaziah hid himself behind a shed. And he said, find him. And ended his life. That's the story. Verse 8. It came about, verse 8, that when Jehu was executing judgment on the house of Ahab, that he found the princes of Judah and the sons of Ahaziah's brothers ministering to Ahaziah and slew them. And he sought Ahaziah, and they caught him while he was hiding in Samaria. And they brought him to Jehu and put him to death and buried him, gave him a proper burial, because he said, he is the son of Jehoshaphat who sought the Lord with all his heart. So there was no one of the house of Ahaziah to retain the power of the kingdom. Not yet. Now, when Athaliah, the mother of Ahaziah, saw that her son was dead, she rose up. Now, listen to how bad this gets. She rose up and destroyed all of his children, her grandchildren, all of the royal offspring of the house of Judah, and so that she can become queen mother. The daughter of Jezebel is now the queen of Judah in the south. I asked you earlier, how bad can this get? Oh, that's how bad it can get. The daughter of Jezebel is the queen of Judah in the south. That's how bad it got. That's how bad it got. But what about that promise? That God would always have a lamp for David. Notice verse 11. But Jehoshabeth, the king's daughter, took Joash, the son of Ahaziah, and stole him from among the king's sons who were being put to death and placed him and his nurse in the bedroom. Uh, this child of the king was probably one year old, 12 months old, and she hid him as a baby. She took him and hid him in the bedroom. So Jehoshabeth, the daughter of King Jehoram, Notice, wife of Jehoiada, the priest. She's the daughter of the king, but she's the wife of a priest. And she was sister of Ahaziah. She hid him from Athaliah so that he or that she would not put the boy, the baby, to death. And he was hidden with them in the house of God. In the house of God, they kept him hidden for six years. Well, Athaliah reigned over the land like a, well, like a wicked daughter of Jezebel that she was. Chapter 23, we'll go quickly. Now, in the seventh year, Jehoiada, after seven years, or rather in the seventh year, Jehoiada, the priest, was ready. He strengthened himself. He took captains of hundreds. Azariah, he's naming them, Azariah, the son of Jeroham, Ishmael, the son of Johan, Azariah, the son of Obed, Maasiah, the son of Adiah, and Elashaphat, the son of Zikri, and they entered into a covenant with him. And they went out throughout Judah, gathered all the Levites from the cities of Judah, and the heads of father's households of Israel, and they came to Jerusalem. Then all the assembly made a covenant with the king in the house of God. And Jehoiada the priest said to them, Behold, the king's son shall reign, as Jehovah has spoken concerning the sons of David. This is the thing that you shall do. One third of you, of the priests and the Levites who come in on the Sabbath, you shall be gatekeepers. Another third shall be at the king's house, and another third shall be at the gate of the fountain, or the foundation. And all of the people shall be in the courts of the house of the Lord. But let no one enter the house of the Lord except the priests and the ministering Levites. They may enter, for they are holy, and let all the people keep charge of the Lord. So the Levites will surround the king, each man with his weapons in his hand. Whoever enters the house, let him be killed. Thus be with the king when he comes in and when he goes out. So the Levites and all Judah did according to all that Jehoiada the priest commanded. Each of them took his men, who were to come in on the Sabbath, with those who were to go out on the Sabbath. For Jehoiada the priest did not dismiss any of the divisions. Then Jehoiada the priest gave to the captains of hundreds the spears and large and small shields, which had been King David's, which were in the house of God. And he stationed all the people, each man with his weapon in his hand, from the right side of the house to the left side of the house, by the altar and by the house, around the king. Then they brought out the king's son and put the crown on him, and gave him the testimony 
and made him king. And Jehoiada and his sons anointed him and said, Long live the king. When Athaliah heard the noise of this, the people running and praising the king, she came into the house of the Lord to the people. And she looked and behold, to her shock and surprise, the king standing by the king's pillar at the entrance with captains and trumpeters beside the king and all the people of the land rejoicing and blowing trumpets, singers with their musical instruments leading the praise. And Athaliah tore her clothes and she said, this is treason, treason. And Jehoiada the priest brought out captains of hundreds who were appointed over the army and said to them, bring her out. Bring her out between the ranks. And whoever follows her, put him to death with the sword. For the priest said, let her not be put to death in the house of the Lord. So they seized her. And when they brought her out, they arrived at the entrance of the horse gate in the king's house. They put her to death there. Thus ended the queen of Judah in the darkest night of Israel. For the promise to David was held by the flicker of the smallest light. But God watched. In verse 16, Jehoiada then made a covenant between himself and all the people and the king that they should be the Lord's people. And all the people, and right there, that's like that's a that's a victory verse right there. All the people should be shouting, Woo! That's amazing. And all the people went out to the house of, the, uh, of, of Baal and tore it down. Now, again, this is the formula of revival. Making uh, things right with God is one aspect of revival. The second aspect of revival is getting rid of all the stuff that the world has built into your life. That's got to be part of revival because you can't have one and not the other, and call it revival. Anybody understand what I'm saying? It's not just, you, you have the Lord, you got to come back to the Lord, and you come back to the Lord with hum, humble heart, and with a new heart, and with a desire for God's blessing on your life, and a love relationship, you want that which is beautiful in your life, you got to come with all of that if you want revival. But that's part of revival. The other part of revival is saying to the stuff that the world has built into your life, you got to look at all that stuff and say, be gone. I don't want this stuff in my life anymore because this stuff is poison to my soul. This stuff is wrecking my life. There's nothing good that's going to come out of this stuff. Yeah, it pleased my flesh, but it is poison to the soul. And I want my soul alive, and I want the flesh to be defeated. So I don't want this stuff in my life anymore. That's the second part of revival. And you can't have revival without both parts. Anybody agree with me? Let's give the Lord praise. This is a powerful understanding. And I tell you, it is what God is doing. It is what God is doing. God is doing it. I say that with great boldness today. I am seeing it. I'm seeing lives change right now. I'm seeing it. It's beautiful what's happening. There are, there are so many who are like, I want the things of God in my life. I don't want the things of the world anymore. Get rid of these things out of my life. Because I tell you, there are many things that people hold on to in secret, in darkness, and in the uh, darkness of their heart. They hold on to these things, and they continue to, uh, to imbibe in the poisonous things that defeat the soul. But when the soul comes alive, you see it for what it is, and you don't want that anymore. God is doing that. That's what God is doing. And people are seeing it. Eyes are opened. And I'll tell you, once you've tasted how good the soul can be, how beautiful the soul can be, you don't want to go back anymore. And I love that part. He made a covenant. And then they went out and tore down uh, the altars, broke it up. Verse 18, moreover, Jehoiada placed officers or offices of the house of the Lord under the authority of the Levitical priests, whom David had assigned over the house of the Lord to offer burnt offerings of the Lord, as it is written in the law of Moses, with rejoicing, with singing, according to the order of David. In other words, not only is this going to be that we're going to make a new covenant, not only are we going to tear down the Baal aspect of the altars of the world, but we're going to 
have now a bearing of life. We're going to sing. We're going to worship. We're going to stand fast. So he stationed gatekeepers of the house of the Lord so that no one should enter who was in any way unclean. And he took the captains of hundreds and nobles and rulers of the people and all the people of the land and brought the king down from the house of the Lord and came to the upper gate to the king's house. And they placed the king upon the royal throne. So all of the people of the land rejoiced. And the city was quiet, for they had put Athaliah to death with the sword. And thus ends chapter 23 on a tremendous note of victory and a picture of revival. And we're encouraged. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the word that just shows the principles that not only were true in those days, that they are still true to this day. That you still are drawing people into a relationship that is beautiful. What a, what a picture you, you, you showed us in the word today. That it matters to God. That this relationship to the Lord is so beautiful to the Lord. It means so much to him. That he doesn't want anything in your life that would hinder it. God loves you so much. You are a great treasure, he says. Don't let anything, anything in your life stand in the way of that which is beautiful. It means so much to the Lord. This relationship that you have, that he has with you. Church, how many would say to the Lord today, well, it means so much to me. It means a lot to me, too. I don't want anything to hinder that which is God's beautiful work in me. I don't want anything to stand in the way. I want, I want you, God. I want victory. I want, I want that life. I want to celebrate with joy that which we have, Lord. That's what I want. Church, is that you? Is that your desire? Would you just raise your hand if that is your desire? It's a way of praying. It's a way of saying, God, I just want to declare it. Here I raise my hand to you as a way of saying, God, it means something to me too. I want that which is beautiful in my life. Father, thank you. Oh, how we thank you for what you're doing in us now. In Jesus' powerful name. And everyone said, can we give the Lord praise and glory and honor?